Hello and a very well, warm welcome to the first webinar of our series on youth employment and politics. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Marioko Ostrom. I'm a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies and I'll be chairing the session today. So the webinar series is part of the IDS strategic research initiative on uh, ensuring decent work and inclusive politics for young people. And I'm sure most of you joining us today know why it is important to focus on youth in the context of international development. And not just because of the world's demographic today, but also now uh, because of the implications of the pandemic, which will have uh, huge effects for probably generations to come. And we will have six webinars between now and June, and all will focus on Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa and the Middle East. And what we will do in each of the webinars is to link regional trends to the lived experiences of young men and women on the ground. Today's webinar focuses on mobility, security and livelihoods in West Africa and the Horn. We will first listen to three presentations uh, by uh, academics, and then we will hear reflections from the two discussants. We will draw connections to wider academic debates and also policy debate. And you as the audience, you can participate by writing your questions uh, through the Q&A function or the chat. We will first hear all the speakers and discussants, and we want to cover the first couple of questions within the first hour. And those of you interested to stay on for discussion are very welcome to stay for another 30 minutes. So it is my pleasure then to introduce you to our three speakers. The first speaker is Dr. Jesper Bjarnesen, who is cultural anthropologist and senior researcher at the Nordic Africa Institute. His expertise is on the regional migration and mobility in war affected settings. And he has focused particularly on Burkina Faso and Côte d'Ivoire on issues like the dynamics of return migration, urban integration and cross-border combatant recruitment. Our second speaker is Do Dr. Dorte Torsen, research fellow at IDS. She has worked on gender and adolescence, on youth migrants and informality in West, West Africa, in all Sahel countries. And she has recently concluded a study on youth living through the pandemic in Burkina Faso, as well as climate change induced migration. And then our third speaker is Dr. Adam Nash Bogale. She is assistant professor at the Addis Ababa University and an incredible interdisciplinary background, degrees in development studies and law, a PhD in social work and social development. And she has expertise on migration, particularly return migration, youth and gender in Ethiopia and the Horn. And she has collaborated with scholars at the University of Sussex for several years now on the Migration Out of Poverty project. I will introduce you to the discussants after we've listened to the three uh, presentations. So can I please invite Dr. Jasper Bjarnason to, um, to start your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And, and thank you to the entire IDS team for having me. It's really a, a pleasure to, to be here with you today. Um, I've, I've called slightly provo provocatively my, my uh, contribution here, Smart Moves, uh, Youth Security and Mobility in West Africa. Uh, and I'll be talking about the West African context uh, with a particular focus on the, the Sahel region where I have been conducting anthropological research uh, in, in the past few years on regional labor mobility dynamics, um, in addition to the research that uh, Madjorki already uh, mentioned. Um, so I've been invited here to paint some broad strokes regarding youth mobilities in the region, uh, and I've chosen to be quite selective with the, the, the issues that I want to raise in order to be able to sort of engage with what I see as the predominant narratives around uh, youth mobilities in this particular context. Uh, but sort of to get us started, um, one, one main uh, uh, sort of characteristic of the region, as you can see here, is that many of the countries in the region uh, are sort of on the lower end of uh, the Human Development Index uh, listing. Uh, but we should also note that there are some significant migrant receiving countries in West Africa, most notably Cote d'Ivoire, sorry, the marking is a bit off there, um, 
which received more than one, or approximately 1.3 million uh, migrants from Burkina Faso in 2018 alone. Uh, so it's one of Africa's main uh, migrant receiving countries. We also have uh, uh, Nigeria, Senegal, and Ghana as countries where, where that are both sending and receiving migrants. So I think that's important to, to sort of get us started. Um, what I want to do overall here is I want to reflect on youth mobilities by examining the ways in which development, security, and mobility interact, interact and, and uh, interplay uh, in different ways. Um, and I'll argue that the current policy climate, including the tone in much public debate, of course, especially in Europe, but not but elsewhere as well, uh, much debate about African youth mobility actually gets in the way of seeing the moves and motivations that young people engage with for what they are, which I would argue are smart moves. Um, I, I get the picture that many of you listening uh, and contributing today know more about youth uh, uh, issues than I do, but just as a brief overview, you can see that there are different ways of delimiting what youth uh, as a category is about. Uh, I would rely on the broader definition in terms of age, uh, uh, which is used by the African Youth Charter, for example, which is 15 to 35, because I'm more interested in the more qualitative elements around youth than the strict age delimitation. So I choose a fairly broad uh, uh, entry point here. Um, I could say more about that, but perhaps we can save that for the discussion. Um, and I'll, so what I'll do now is I'll investigate the interplays between these three notions that I presented, mobility development and security in pairs in order to help us sort of break down what they are about. And let's start with the mobility development uh, uh, pairing. Um, as part of that context, of course, it's important to understand that the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic is having and will continue to have significant effects on overall socioeconomic conditions in the region. Um, as you can see here by, by the ADB projection, which I don't know, I, I hope to hear from, from others uh, today, but I think that the projection that uh, Africa's GDP will recover towards uh, the end of this year seems very optimistic, which is how I read this uh, graph. Uh, I would imagine that the economic effects of the pandemic will linger on for much, much longer, uh, especially perhaps in in West Africa. Uh, so I think that's an important part of the, con important part of the context. Um, and then of course, um, the pandemic, not just in terms of travel restrictions, but also in, in terms of uh, decreasing productivity and, and livelihood opportunities is affecting mobility dynamics. Uh, it is becoming more difficult for, for people to move uh, even in West Africa. And I wouldn't uh, cut it down to uh, primarily to travel restrictions uh, imposed to restrict uh, infection uh, uh, dispersion in West Africa, but rather to the sort of secondary effects of the pandemic. But perhaps that's something we can come back to. Um, beyond the current pandemic, I would argue that one of the major factors we need to think about, especially thinking in the longer term about um, how mobility and development patterns will be shaped will be about uh, the projected population growth uh, in Africa in general and specifically in West Africa. I think we've all heard this repeatedly now that the, the continent's population ex is expected to double within the next 50 years or so. Um, and this is particularly significant in thinking about the current and future roles of young people. So as you can see on the left in this slide, uh, the demographic projection implies that the African continent will be the only continent where people below the age of 24 uh, uh, will increase as a percentage of the total population. So in all other parts of the world, uh, that demographic will decrease in relation to the total population. Uh, so in other words, Africa as a continent will face the massive challenge of uh, uh, catering for a rapidly growing population but it will also have the potential uh, of having the world's youngest population, which means a much larger proportion of people of a working age, right? So there's at least two sides to that coin. Um, and in, or, in order to make the most of this demographic development, migration and mobility will have to be used as tools for development as they have been in West Africa for generations. 
uh, people move for, for longer or shorter uh, uh, distances and over longer shorter time periods, uh, not just for uh, the kind of sort of nomadic pastoralism that this picture uh, illustrates, but also, uh, uh, but other mobile categories would be agricultural workers, traders, people involved in mining and a range of other occupational mobilities. So these have been going on and they will in continue to be extremely important for the region in the future. And I think this is captured quite uh, sort of uh, explicitly in uh, the recently uh, um, ratified, um, uh, sorry, uh, African Continental Free Trade uh, Area Agreement in 2018, which as part of its framework has sort of the notion of facilitating free movement uh, on, a, on a continental level, which also resonates very well with the West African Protocol for the Free Movement of People, which was ratified in, in 1979 by ECOWAS, uh, the, the um, Economic Community for West African States. Um, and even at the global level, I think there is an increase, increasing sort of acknowledgement that, um, that it is productive to facilitate what, what at, uh, at the UN level is, is framed as safe, orderly and regular migration. Um, I would note just as an aside here that the global compact, which was also agreed on in 2018, has struggled to keep up some momentum. You see it now, for example, in the discussions of the European Pact on Asylum and Migration, where the global framework isn't even mentioned. But there is kind of a, a similar sentiment here that migration can and should be used as a tool for development uh, in line with the sustainable development goals. So these were just a few quick sort of thoughts about the, how mobility and development uh, interrelate uh, in this region. Uh, let me now consider mobility in relation to security. And here, the, the sort of predominant security factor in West Africa right now, as I see it, would be the uh, Sahelian crisis, uh, which is centered on central Mali, but which has been regionalizing for the past uh, five years at least. Um, uh, this security crisis is becoming increasingly complicated, uh, involving a, a growing number of armed actors. We have jihadist groups with backing from Al-Qaeda and uh, IS, which are op operating regionally, attacking state officials, local communities, and international forces, and using the instability in the region uh, allegedly to traffic uh, arms and drugs and other valuable resources. At the same time, we also have local community defense groups clashing over much more localized security concerns. Um, that's a really complex dynamic, but part of the picture is that the, the jihadist groups are sort of trying to play out different population groups against each other. For example, evoking uh, historical uh, uh, confrontations between farmers and herder communities in the region. So this, this security crisis is becoming ex exceedingly uh, uh, complex and, and uh, uh, imposing, you could say. Uh, one of the major effects is relating to mobility. Uh, there's a massive uh, displacement crisis happening in the Sahel region. You have more than 1 million uh, IDPs in Burkina Faso alone, and uh, more than 1.5 million displaced people in the region overall, uh, which is, of course, uh, um, a massive liability for these uh, uh, states. Um, I could say much more about this, but that would take us too far from the time slot and, and the theme perhaps. But I want to mention also that when we talk about security uh, in this particular context, that word security has taken on a different meaning in recent years, especially after the uh, so-called European refugee crisis of 2015-16, because uh, European states are engaging in a sort of uh, externalization of their own border security by imposing uh, and, and building uh, um, border control capacities in the Sahelian region in a sort of a growing uh, uh, section of, of West Africa. Uh, so security concerns are not just local and they're not just regional, they also intermix with uh, these sort of uh, external concerns of, of European actors in uh, uh, controlling movement in order to uh, combat terrorism, but also to uh, uh, restrict uh, irregular migration towards Europe. Um, as a parenthesis, of course, during the pandemic, there have been travel restrictions, not just towards Europe, but within uh, the African continent and within Africa as well. 
um, I haven't been able, for the same reasons, haven't been able to travel much myself. But what I hear is that um, border, international border crossings in the region are possible and they're mainly restrictive towards sort of larger transportation uh, vehicles such as uh, trucks and buses, but that people can continue to cross international borders uh, as they have been doing more or less. Um, so to consider the final pairing security development, uh, obviously the Sahelian conflict or crisis is affecting livelihoods in many ways. For example, in agriculture where people are unable to tend to their farms because uh, uh, of, of, of the, the risk of violence. Um, but there's also sort of a, a, an increased economic recession because less trade and business is able to happen, et, et cetera. And all this, of course, is being exacerbated by these localized conflicts, which, which have been on the rise in, in the last two or three years. Um, in large parts of central Mali and northern Burkina Faso, schools have been closed for a long time now, uh, which, of course, will affect young people in the long term and which might uh, be particularly problematic for girls and young women who might not be able to return to school once they've been home with their families uh, uh, during an extended period of time. So there are some gender dynamics that I'll touch a little bit on, but which I'm sure uh, uh, the other speakers will also be able to help us understand better. Um, so the, the deteriorating security situation in the Sahel has obviously created a lot of frustration and, and we've seen a lot of public protests uh, uh, against the Sahelian governments, but also against international interference with a lot of anti-French sentiment in the region. Um, and and the, these frustrations were sort of a, a central factor in, the, in last year's coup in Mali uh, in August, where people were fed up with uh, sort of un, uh, corruption and, and the performance of the state in general, but also the failure to, to achieve any progress in terms of the security situation. So there's been a public mobilization also because of this uh, situation. And here again, uh, youth play an important part. Uh, young people are, are generally an important part of the voting population. And they're also usually in, at the front line, so to speak, uh, in popular mobilization, as we've seen it, for example, in 2014 in Burkina Faso, where the Valais Citoyen uh, Youth Association was one of the sort of primary actors in, in creating public mobilization against the regime. Um, but what I would, would just emphasize is that although we see young people actively engaging in public mobilization, uh, which doesn't just include protests, but also other forms of social activism, although they do that, it's rather they see the benefits of the changes that are sort of uh, forced through by this public mobilization. Uh, uh, in many societies, power and influence is still centered around the older generations. And this is not just true, true of, of national elites, but also at the local level. Um, so just, uh, uh, again, a few thoughts. And, and to summarize, while the deepening security crisis is making it even harder to find work and make a living, popular mobilization tends to create somewhat superficial changes in in terms of political leadership, but often fails to create substantial transformations for, especially for young people. Um, so the bottom line here, what does this tell us about uh, youth mobilities in this context? I would emphasize the issue of access. Um, African youths are fighting for access to both, uh, to both local and global restrictive hierarchies, you could say. And, Access is sometimes used in a very kind of neutral way or, or, or as a, uh, an issue related to just development. When, for example, when you talk about lack of access to healthcare or access to education. But I would argue that uh, these spheres of influence that young people are, tr are trying to access are guarded. They are guarded by local as well as global actors. So the struggle for access is also a political struggle. Uh, and this is not just true in terms of political mobilization or even in the struggle for access to better life opportunities in Europe through migration. It's also true of gendered access to education, livelihood options, which will restrict the possibilities for girls and young women across the region in different ways. So there are many sides to this political struggle, I would argue. And this brings me towards the conclusion. I I have lost track of time, but I'm almost done. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I think this attention to political struggle for access is an important perspective from which to understand the interplay between mobility development and security in this context. Um, and I would argue that this is a perspective that uh, challenges uh, predominant narratives around these issues, which tend to focus on the problem of irregular migration uh, towards Europe, on the problem of radicalization and extremism in relation to jihadist terrorism. A more youth-centered approach, I would argue, uh, is, uh, is needed, and what is needed is a wholehearted appreciation of the social realities of young people and the socially and culturally embedded narratives and aspirations they articulate. Um, so I hope that these broad strokes have provided some entry into our discussion today. Uh, I want to sort of uh, emphasize three different uh, uh, issues here. First, that Security and mobility are key spheres to consider in order to understand the development challenges and opportunities of young people in the region, and that the lives and livelihoods of young people uh, are, are in, uh, sort of um, intertwined with security and with security and mobility in complex ways. Uh, second, that young people are not just this problematic category that they're often made out to be. Um, uh, sorry. They're at the front lines of many of the major key challenges and opportunity, opportunities that the future will bring. And they're engaged in this constant struggle for access. Uh, finally, rather than simply advocating that young people have a productive role to play, I imagine that we all kind of can agree on that. Uh, I hope to have conveyed that even when involved in the spheres that are highlighted as examples of problematic engagement, such as irregular migration or uh, participation in armed conflict, we should recognize their engagement as part of a struggle for access. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that from this youth-centered perspective, dominant discourses on migration and security disregard that young people's engagements in these domains are, to a large extent, smart moves. This doesn't mean that we as people involved in youth policies in different arenas should encourage young people to engage in the most politicized and dangerous livelihood strategies, but simply that we should think of such choices, not as expressions of radicalization or criminality, but as strategies to make the most of challenging circumstances. So I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jesper, for giving us that um, that introduction, that broad brush overview. I really appreciate how you actually are making us think about whose security are we actually talking about. Um, and we're moving on swiftly to the next speaker, Dorte Torsen, who will speak about adolescent migrants who tend to be overlooked in the whole debate of migration. And I think she will also bring to the fore some of these issues of of security, but everyday securities and insecurities. Dorte, the floor is yours. And I can see that people have started posting questions, which is great. We will collect those and after the discussions, we will uh, give everyone the opportunity to respond. Can well, you hear me at all? Uh, yes, we can hear your daughter. Do you want to share? I can't get you up on my screen, see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've disappeared on my screen for some reason, which is unusual. You I'm can start sharing sure your why. screen or your PowerPoint. Yeah, maybe I'll try to share my PowerPoint and see. Uh, I can't get on my screen, that's the problem. I can see my Zoom web webinar, but I can't get on my screen. Shall I try to log out and re-log in? No, I'm afraid we'll lose you. We can uh, share from this end. Yeah, Rachel has started okay, sharing. Okay. Great, thank you. Can I just put up my hand uh, or can I still move around? Yeah, Rachel, I'll just put up my hand like this when I want a new slide then. Okay, yeah, so leading on from Jesper's presentation, I'm zooming in on the mobility's development perspective, but not in the usual sense of 
looking at transnational migration, remittances and so forth. I'm leaving that to Ademnesh. Uh, my focus is on mobility as a source of livelihood and as a source of skill sets outside farming. So I'm looking at rural youth. Uh, so I'm also looking at the development in, in the sense of a proliferation of job opportunities that are often con uh, concentrated in urban areas and of rural youth wanting to be engaging in and be part of these opportunities and of rural youth wanting to widen their worldviews and experiences. So in many ways, what Jesper talks about as smart moves. You're already aware that the youth category is somewhat fluent, fluent, so stretching from 15 years up to 24, 32 or 35 years and overlapping in fact with childhood and adolescence at the, at the lower rungs. Obviously there, there, there will be significant differences between a youth age 15, 16 years or one age 30 to 32 years with respect to their views and their experiences. And these differences are also gendered and relative to social class and education. In this presentation, I'll draw your attention to the younger tier of youth adolescents and their experiences of moving to urban areas in search of work. My focus will be on adolescent boys because their pathways vacillate between the realm of their network of kin and the informal labor market, whereas adolescent girl migrants tend to navigate a much tighter knit network of kin, and we don't get the same insights uh, into how the labor market is working. I will highlight key findings from two studies, a multi-sided study that I carried out between 2005 and 2008 with adolescent boys in Ouagadougou and Abidjan, uh, where they're coming from a region in Burkina Faso where I've been working for a long time. So I did multi-sided uh, research and also visiting the parents to hear the parents' views on their migration and how they were doing and so forth. The other project I'm um, highlighting findings from, very few in fact, uh, are an ongoing project in the Casamance region of Senegal, which I do with a colleague, Melanie Chacmont. And we've been doing research again with adolescents and youth, and this time since 2017. The adolescent boys' experiences reveal very important, important uh, details about the working of the informal labor market uh, that we don't really get from the labor statistics on employment and unemployment uh, and unemployment. So when we're thinking of that move from uh, rural villages to the bigger cities, it, it's part of, of young people's gradual uh, introduction to the economic spheres of, of life. So they're already working at home. So it's really just an extension of the work they do at home. Uh, at home, they're an important source of unpaid labor for their family, uh, but they are also encouraged to start up their own activities uh, in their own right for themselves schooling will impact on how much time they have for their own activities during the school year. Migrating into the cities is a way of trying to gain more time to, to earn money for themselves, to save up uh, for buying things or for going to school if it's the school students. It's also a way, as I said before, to, to open their eyes to, to other realities. They're really very interested in, in trying to experience the city. Um, but it's very important to, to acknowledge that who they're traveling with makes a huge difference to what, what they experience at the beginning. Uh, if, they were, if they travel on their own or travel with peers, they are starting off in a very different way than if they start work with, or travel with a, a relative who will perceive them as unpaid family labor and also encourage them to enter the or maybe encourage them to in, um, enter the informal labor market. So in a sense, I'll, I'll go into the uh, findings from Burkina to explain that a bit better. Uh, so when, when they, the pathways of adolescents who are newly arrived in Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso, varied significantly depending on their travel companions exactly. So they all came with the aim to work but they, if they arrived on their own or with peers, which about half of the 70 uh, 
at least the migrants I interviewed did, they often accepted very low paid work only to find out after some weeks or, or some months that they were grossly underpaid and they were paid in cash and kind, but they really discovered how, how, how little they were getting and much lower than sort of the fixed informal rate in, in Wagadougou. They, they found work by just going from place to place to ask for, for, for employment. And they were mostly employed in small restaurants doing dishes or helping serving food or selling cold drinks uh, like this young man on the street um, where they would get a fixed commission of 20% of their sales or a fixed wage of uh, 3,000 francs CFA, which would equal one tenth of the formal minimum wage. So entering the labor market in this manner emphasized the wage labor relation uh, that the young people were wishing, wishing for, wished for, or perhaps rather the wage itself, uh, because the employment uh, relationship was blurry as the adolescents were generally very happy to sleep in their employer's household. And they saw it as very positive if they were treated even like a marginal household member. They also often left wages with the, with the employer in order to save up. So it was a very blurred employment relationship. Adolescents traveling with a relative worked with this relative, or as I said before, were introduced to an employer within the relative's social network. So due to this involvement of a senior who knew the going rates for different uh, jobs, they were usually paid appropriately. Um, the jobs they did were not very different though to what the others found. Rachel, you can change, yeah, thank you. So the occupational repertoire is worthwhile looking at uh, for adolescent migrants who come with very little education uh, was restricted to itinerant street work and work in low end restaurants or food places along the street, uh, along the roadside. Some worked in brick making, uh, some were helped, very few in fact, were helped into apprenticeships by their relatives. The, the apprenticeship part, not, not quite yet, sorry, that was my hand coming up. Um, the, the reason why they didn't go into apprenticeships was both that the parents would or the relatives would not necessarily find them a space to, to do a, um, an apprenticeship, but often it was also because they wanted to earn money and as an apprentice, they wouldn't. So they weren't interested in the beginning in, um, in an apprenticeship. Although the job repertoire was really restricted, it didn't mean that adolescents remained with the same employer or even in the same line of work. They changed jobs to get a higher wage. They changed job to try try out other work. They 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 changed jobs to avoid being exploited, uh, and they changed job to to get them a higher social status because certain jobs had had a, um, was associated with higher status. But the widespread social agreement on what constitutes age and gender appropriate work for young people, in particular in particularly these age groups I'm talking about, and that counts not just for girls, but also for boys. Um, so people are looking at, employers are looking at their approximate age and, and associated physical stature. And if they weren't very old looking, they weren't able to get jobs with a higher status, a higher wage. Um, so they remained lowly paid and they would have to wait until they grew older to, get, to, to tap into these other jobs of the older. Uh, migrants. We look at youth migrants from rural Burkina Faso in Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire. <clears throat> the labor market was quite different when they first arrived. In Ouagadougou they had been at liberty to move outside the network of kin because they could find jobs by going door to door. In Abidjan they depended on kin. Um, that might have been very much because I did research in 2007, 2008, just around the time of uh, the peace accord. So the conflict in Cote d'Ivoire was not quite finished by then. And there was a lot of distrust against Burkina Bay migrants. So the labor market was different. Uh, they also risked to be stopped by police uh, and having to pay money and having to do push-ups and whatever the soldiers fancy to ask them to do. Uh, just in a, in a way of showing them that they were marginalized in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire. 
So they needed to some, they needed someone to vouch for their good character to get a job at all. Uh, and mostly they had to work for relatives to have a job at all. As in Wagadougou, working for a relative implied a bit of pocket money to, to spend, but expecting to be paid a lump sum and the transportation back to Burkina Faso once they wanted to go back and visit. Such arrangements obviously rested on trust, but sometimes the trust uh, eroded if the business was waning or if the proprietor misused their money or some, somehow otherwise were unable to, to honor this implicit contract. And on such occasions, the youth sought other relatives in Abidjan. So in a way, there was changing um, employment like they'd been doing in, in Ouagadougou. They sought other relatives they could work with and they sought to move into other types of work. So rather than working in shops and restaurants, they tried to move into brick making and hand irrigated vegetable farming because such work was treated as wage work, work rather than uh, family labor. The conundrum here is that they were not so young anymore because they had been in Ouagadougou before they actually had enough money to travel on to, to Cote d'Ivoire very often in many cases. So they were no longer at the early end of adolescence. They were at the late end of adolescence or early twenties. They had a different physical stature and they were able to do more heavy work. So that opened new job opportunities. Now I'm leaving uh, Burkina Faso and Cote d'Ivoire behind to fast forward to 2017 and move into Senegal to look at uh, a particular subcategory of adolescent migrants, namely the students who are migrating to work during the long summer holidays. And we're seeing that not just in, in Senegal, we're seeing that across West Africa, that there are more and more students who, who travel to work in order to help paying uh, school expenses and in order to show their families that they are committed to this uh, investment in their own future. So it's not just something that is given to them uh, and they sit back and relax. The students work as porters and they work in small restaurants in, in, in markets and in bus stations. And some of them work incredibly hard to the point of being exploited and may indeed, like we've seen elsewhere, move to, to different employers who expect uh, less toil, uh, even if that might mean that they earn a little bit less uh, towards their schooling. However, what I find two points interesting. One of them is this map that I'm showing where we had some students who were 16, 17, 18, 19, uh, drawing a map on their migrations uh, and showing that many of them had actually been migrating since they were seven, eight, nine years old and moving all over Senegal to work during the long holidays. So coming to Second Show and Casamons was uh, somewhere on the, their itinerary of, of, of testing out different sites of work and different types of work in, in Senegal. So it was about getting money for their schooling. It was also about um, opening their eyes to, to other ways of living, other parts of Senegal and other uh, income possibilities. And another point I find really interesting is that they are finding jobs in sectors that were not seasonal. So there, there seemed to be no real need for an influx of young transient laborers in these places where they worked. But at the same time, they're working in markets and bus stations where the flow of, of, of uh, labor is quick and people come and leave the jobs. So that's probably why they could get the jobs there. But there seemed to be this uh, point of, of, um, of the employers to taking on these students to make sure that they could show their, their families how, how they invested in the time. So they were, not, they were sort of included in the labor market in that sense. So there's a so, sort of a social, social um, conscience. And then we come to um, the full hour of COVID. Uh, and it's true, as, as Mayoka said, that I've been doing a study in, on COVID uh, with two researchers, one in Ghana and one in Burkina Faso. We have not particularly focused on youth. We've more focused on what kind of, of um, responses the states were, were um, suggesting and, and implementing to contain the virus, but also to mitigate the outcome of these containment measures. There, were, there was very little attention to youth, in fact, and there are certain, 
certainly nothing at all on on uh, migrant adolescents or migrant youth at all. Uh, so so they have been left behind. But what is interesting to look at is perhaps that. In Wakadugu, lockdown was for three weeks. Those three weeks might not have made a huge difference on the young people's work. They might have been out of work for three weeks, but they would have been catered for by relatives. Their social network is thick uh, in Wakadugu. It's migration for many years and lots of circulation. Or they could have, they might have gone home in case um, they 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 were they were locked down. The longer term effect, though, might be the rising food prices, which might not impact so directly on them, or it may, but it's more likely to impact on them in, in terms of that their employers will not have enough money to pay their wages, so there's, they're more likely to be pressed on the wages or experience more non-payment. In Abidjan, I don't really have much information about um, about lockdown from what I hear from colleagues working and living in Abidjan is in fact there is has not been very much lockdown at all people have moved around and haven't really thought it was very serious uh, so as soon as you're outside the center of the city and particularly if you're in unplanned settlements they operate at the margins of authority so a lockdown would be almost impossible my guess is that for many of these youth they, there has not been a lot of of, um, of uh, negative impact. It might be in terms of the in, in increased prices. And we have to remember that these are rural youth, they're migrants. They are in a very different position than many of the youth that Jesper was speaking about, who are politicized, who are educated, who are part of another part of, of, uh, of, um, of, um, of youth. And then lastly, in second show, the markets reopened in May, so again, it wouldn't have been a long-term um, problem for the young migrants, and they would probably have been catered for by relatives, or they would have travelled back home uh, if they couldn't get any any um, any income. However, the school closures will be the most important uh, negative impact mm -hmm. on them, and particularly these students who would travel during the long school holidays might have wanted to try to travel during school closures, and I don't know if they've been able to do so and if they would have been able to find jobs. So my conclusion, and it's just three key takeaways, is really considering that uh, adolescent migrants, um, is, that for them, the labor market is deeply, deeply social with regard to employment relationships, remuneration, the timing of payment, and also even getting the job. So the conundrum for, for, at the policy level is how to work for decent work with some formalization without losing this informal social protection of the youngest workers who do not know their way so well around the city. And then the second point is given that adolescent and youth migrants build up experience and skill sets through mobilities within the labor market and to other countries, how do we consider, how can this flexibility of changing jobs be harnessed to introduce rural youth to a much broader range of occupations than they are, are knowledgeable of from the rural uh, context? And then the third point is, given that we actually don't know about the effect of, of COVID containment um, responses and, and mitigation responses uh, on adolescents, but we know that there are recurrent shocks in Burkina Faso. There is the, the security se um, situation. Much of the health is a security session. There are droughts, there are, there are floods that are also hitting the cities. So I wonder if it would be worthwhile to think about devising a social insurance for adolescents to cushion them against some, some shocks and really to target them as independent actors in the labor market. Thanks, Thank Dorothy. That's great. Thank you. So social protection, social measures for the youngest youth that are not often thought about. We'll move swiftly to uh, Adam Nash, uh, Bogala. Uh, the floor is yours. We will speak further to family dynamics. Thank you. Adam Nash, you're still mute. Sorry. 
So thank you. And uh, my presentation is a little bit different in its perspective. It uh, deals with uh, uh, the gender and intergenerational dynamics of young migrants uh, in Ethiopia. But before going directly to the study, I wanted to go uh, to a brief overview on the trend on Ethiopian or Horn of Africa migration. And at the end, I will say a few, uh, I will point out a few issues on COVID and conflict um, implications. So first to see the trend uh, of Ethiopian and Horn of uh, African uh, migration, it's important to know the migration routes. So the first route is the Horn of Africa route where um, people move within uh, the Horn. And the second is the Eastern route that goes to the, the Arab Peninsula, meaning Saudi Arabia and Yemen mainly. And the third one is the Southern route that goes to South Africa. And the fourth one is the Northern route that goes to Europe. So migrants, they start their um, uh, journey either in Ethiopia or in any part of the Horn and use these four uh, routes to go to their final destination. But before reaching their final destinations, they have uh, to stay in transit countries such as Kenya and Tanzania for the southern route and going to the eastern route, they stay in Djibouti and Somalia and so on. But from these four routes, we have seen that the migration, the flow of, uh, of migration for Ethiopia and the Horn is highly dominated towards the eastern route mainly and also the Horn of African route, particularly Currently, uh, because of the COVID, there's a, some sort of shift towards the movement in the Horn of Africa. And from uh, in terms of nationality, Ethiopians and Somalis are seen to be dominating this uh, movement, particularly Ethiopians are highly uh, seen to be moving. Uh, and uh, the most relevant and important corridor for Ethiopians and also for the Horn is the Eastern route. Men are uh, seen to be dominating the movement. And for reasons of migration, the recorded reasons are mostly economic. And also there are also other reasons such as seasonal movement and uh, conflict, but it is well dominated by the economic movement. So when you see the migrant uh, profile, I have taken a report on the first half of the year 2020, you can see that uh, the Eastern route, the Northern route, and the Horn of Africa route is mainly dominated by Ethiopians, while the Southern route is mainly dominated by the Somalis, recording 97% of uh, the migrants. And here you can see the trend. Again, I'm using the, the latest uh, report. You can see a rise from January and a sharp decline in March that is due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, which uh, particularly in, in the Eastern uh, route that uh, uh, where migrants were unable to move forward. And you can see the Horn of Africa route. Uh, it, it's, there's also a decline in March, but there is, um, it picks up in April and May, which you can see, which is also due to the COVID uh, border restrictions and that migrants were not able to go to their final destination, so they were moving uh, in the horn. So this is the general overview, just to, for you to understand what migration looks like from the horn and Ethiopia. Now coming to the study, the focus is what is the impact or the effect of the youth migration in the household dynamics? So the questions that we wanted to answer was, uh, how does migration change the life experiences of young men and women? And also how does migration affect their relationships in terms of power balance within the uh, household? Does, does the area that we did the research on is uh, called South Wolo, that is the Northeastern part of Ethiopia. We selected this uh, site because there is high prevalence of migration towards the Eastern route uh, due to the proximity of the area to Djibouti. So in order to see this, it's important to understand first the social norms uh, regarding gender and uh, generation in the area. So as in most rural parts of uh, Ethiopia, there is a gender bias in role whereby men are for outside work and the women are for domestic chores. And at the same time, children take path on following uh, this line as uh, boys follow on their fathers to farms and uh, girls will uh, follow their mother in uh, engaging in, uh, uh, in the domestic chores. Regarding the generation roles, uh, roles um, 
generally uh, power rests on older people. So parents make every decision in the household while children are expected to obey. Of course, with some exceptions, which we come up with in the discussion part. Um, so parents care for their children at the beginning and then children unfortunately are pushed into maturity a little bit earlier than they should because of the poverty and because of problems in the region, they have to contribute to the household engaging in uh, economic uh, responsibilities. Another important issue here is control over assets. And this control over assets has two dimensions as well, the gender and the generational part. In, in terms of gender, it rests on men usually. If there is a father in the house, it rests on the father. If in the absence of uh, the father, the eldest son takes over the responsibilities. And um, generational wise, it is the older people again. So we can see that the age and gender hierarchies are very firm in here, stating that control over assets and decision maker may, making this um, power rests on older men. So migration, who migrates? This is an important question because for the reason for the region, uh, because of limited opportunity of employment and because of the poverty, migration is seen to be a way out of poverty. It has become a necessity to secure income for the household. So in the uh, region, the norm is that young males are expected and required to be self-reliant because they are expected to uh, handle and uh, be well for their future family, future wife, future children. So they have to be self-reliant while young females are expected to support their natal family unconditionally. So in migration, if we say that migration is taken as a viable means uh, in the region, then young women are expected to support their families, so they are the ones who are migrating. Interestingly, families are also willing uh, to finance the migration of their uh, female um, uh, daughters uh, because the return is good because as they are expected, they also feel the responsibility of supporting their families. But we have also seen that families are reluctant in uh, investing on their uh, sons, on, their, on the young males, because there isn't, the return is not going to be that good and it's not a good investment. So when we, another issue that I want to mention here is in that concept of supporting the family, there's also this subtle, way of seeking independence from the older generations and from the norm as well. We have seen that both with, with the young females and the young males. Um, who is affected? Okay, the young females while going here, we also see both gender and generational aspects. So in terms of gender, when a young female leaves the house, the role that she had, the load that she burdened when she, uh, before she was, uh, before she migrated, will be transferred to her younger sisters. So of course there is an economic gain that comes out of the migration, but that is uh, compromising at the expense of compromising the childhood of her younger sister. For example, if she has a child, caring for her child is the responsibility of the younger sister. On the other hand, younger brothers are seen to be uh, benefiting from this. If the remittance that is sent by the young migrant is a little bit more than uh, or is a little bit beyond the day-to-day -day household consumption, then they, sh they, they somehow invest some of the money on businesses like taxis. Those taxis are handled by their brothers, which is also a benefit for the brothers. On the other hand, in terms of generations, we've also um, noticed that the daughter of the young migrant is some, uh, sometimes handled by her, her mother, that is the grandmother. So the generation also, the shift in generation also is also seen in this aspect. So finally, the, inset, the intersect of migration and negotiation power. Of course, this is the most important thing here. We have seen that these young migrants, because they send money to their parents, because they are contributing to the household financially, they, they have secured some form of uh, negotiating power. And these female migrants, we have seen that they're in a better position to renegotiate what they have been standing for, to disagree with their parents uh, when they're compared with their contemporaries of female, young females with a no migrant uh, household. So they were saying, you get to be heard when you feed the family. And 
this also has two uh, dimensions, the gender part and the generation part. The gender part is that these young migrants are given respect and more power of decision-making uh, in terms of uh, household decisions um, when we see them with their uh, brothers. And the other part is in terms of generation, they, we have also seen them dictating their parents, for example, um, and uh, setting how to spend the money that they send. This is, uh, and also other issues within the household. So it has definitely uh, impacted their migration, has definitely impacted their uh, negotiating power within the household uh, because of the financial, con financial contribution that they are making. So finally, what is the effect of COVID on migration generally and on the youth? I have uh, come up with a few issues here. The most important impact is on the trend. The trend, there, are there is a switch in routes because the Eastern route was the most popular route over the years before the COVID, but because of the strict uh, border restrictions, the route now that, has, that is having the highest movement has become the Horn of Africa because uh, migrants are stranded within the Horn. The other is stranded migrants are seen where, where, because they're unable either to proceed or to return. And this has created xenophobic and discriminatory or stigmatized um, reactions towards these migrants. There's also limited access to coping strategies because when these migrants stay in the transit cities, they accumulate money uh, to further their journey by uh, engaging in informal jobs, which they cannot do now. So that is also an effect. And we have also seen a new migration trend. In, interestingly, there is a spontaneous return from Djibouti to Ethiopia, from Yemen to Djibouti because of this uh, border restrictions. IDB sites are also seen to be affected in terms of employment and um, funding. I would like to see a few issues on conflicts. Ethiopia has now becoming a country uh, that is entertaining so many conflicts and the conflicts are most, uh, mostly in Western and Southern Oromia and the current conflict, I'm sure you all have uh, heard about it. You all are familiar about it in Tigray and Meteca. As of 30th September, then the number of IDPs was uh, 1.8 million of which more than 60% were displaced due to the due to conflict. And the, the new data, which is not um, evidently very much uh, um, uh, not done as, as, um, as per the other data, but uh, we have seen numbers here and there, which accumulated to be more than 400,000 newly IDPs because of the conflict in uh, Tigray. And it also has resulted more than six, with more than 60,000 fleeing to Eastern Sudan, also uh, creating a cross-border displacement. The other also, the other issue is also the conflict in Tigray is um, thought to that it might lead to a new wave of uh, migration or movement to the Eastern route as migrants will be crossing the Red Sea to Yemen and some of them will stay in Yemen and some of them may continue to Saudi Arabia. That is how the Eastern route is, uh, the trend in the Eastern route is showing so far. So um, this is all, sorry for rushing you. I was <laughs> trying to be on time in the interest of time, but no, we will no, have no. a discussion through the Q and A's I'm hoping. Yeah, I can see there have been two questions already for you. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, great job of bringing in both the trends and the real lived experience, experiences and gendered experiences also, no less. Um, maybe you can answer one of the questions already in the chat. There was one from uh, Maya Turola, who works at Include, and she asked which data set you've used. So maybe, and that's, I think, also beneficial to everyone for the trends, so maybe you can drop it in the in the chat and answer to, to everyone. I'd like to introduce uh, the audience to our discuss, discussions. Um, so it's a real pleasure to uh, have two speakers uh, to we will quickly share some reflections. Dr. Roy Huismans is Associate Professor of Childhood and Youth Studies at the International Institute of Social Studies in the Netherlands who works on uh, young people and migration in Southeast Asia. So we can see like, how do these things apply to different contexts? 
And Dr. Raffaele Bettini has a PhD in, in, in development economics and currently works at the International Organization of Migration Regional Office in Cairo. Um, Roy, please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Marioka, and, and hi, I suppose, good afternoon, morning, evening to all of you, panelists and, and uh, attendees. Um, I'll keep it short because there's so many at attendees and they're already asking brilliant questions and they should really have the floor. So um, very quickly, I've, I've enjoyed this enormously, right? Uh, uh, Jesper, a fantastic overview discussion and you... Um, sort of ending on this call for youth-centered approach, I think was immediately taken up by Dr. Torsen and, and, uh, and Dr. also showing in her research how difficult that actually is. Because um, you see these quite young migrants moving through an already very messy informal market, uh, labor market. So just trying to understand how that works for a small group of, of young people is already an enormous task. So let alone doing that for all these many different groups of young people in this category of 50 to 35. Um, Adam Ness uh, brings in the issue of gender, which is obviously for often forgotten when we talk about youth, right? Uh, often the de default settings is youth, we mean young men, but obviously we have young women too. And, and you highlighted some very important um, uh, gender related reflection on them. Yes, thank you for doing that. Now, a few things I just want to throw to the floor and then I already close is, is um, um, thinking about a youth centered approach and what this might mean and going back to this um, African youth charter definition of 15 to 35, which is, you know, quite, quite a chunk of people, right? So those who know, maybe not Jesper or maybe others, what, what have been sort of the, the debates underpinning this age-based definition and and do you think this is useful uh, in terms of policy making and doing actually justice to this vast diversity of young people in this category so that's 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 one um when we talk about migration we often talk about those who leave uh, unsurprisingly um there's of course the other side of the the coin um not all young people necessarily leave some people stay or return and, and have decided well that's been it uh, i've done my moving i've done my migration this is it so what does it mean to be young uh, in these various places and not to move uh, so that's that's sort of a question that that strikes me as important too if we take up a youth-centered approach uh, what does staying mean um now, um, daughter had had uh, a call for for Marioka translated as a social protection. Now we we have these organisation of working children and working youth. I'm not sure how, how prominent or active they are in the various contexts we talked about, but but I sort of wonder to what extent they also accommodate for young migrants, uh, and and if so, whether this would be limited to those sharing the same nationality or also. So more accommodating to, to international young migrants. Um, so I, I'll leave it there. Uh, just a few things to throw in on, on the floor um, because we have others too who uh, want to make use of this time and space. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Roy. And questions are quickly trickling in now. Uh, so that's great. Uh, Raffaele Bettini, please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thanks a lot for having me here. And I'll try to be short and just make uh, two, three points, three comments. So I, I hope you can hear me kind of properly. My first point is more related to Jasper's presentation, but of course towards uh, all, the, all the audience and, uh, and uh, presenters. Uh, that is about the African integration. So how do you see, uh, and in general, say, intra-regional migration in Africa, and uh, how do you see this uh, developing light of, again, uh, restrictions related to COVID-19, but in general, I mean, uh, economic development going on in uh, several areas in, uh, in the continent. So this is the first point. Uh, and the second one is more related to uh, um, the presentation, the second um, presentation that is um, to expand a little bit on the possible uh, uh, outcomes of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, educational impacts of, um, of COVID-19 uh, in young generations. Uh, so what is the dropout, uh, this type of, uh, this type of 
discussion uh, inside the educational system and everything can be related to uh, people, uh, education of young people. And the third point, uh, mm, well, there are several of them. Um, so I can, well, I can also, uh, okay, no, mm, briefly. Um, so uh, you, you related to, to the third presentation, uh, you talk a lot uh, about the gender uh, dimension and I would like to see uh, what is the effect on the uh, left behind uh, people, uh, especially uh, female that have been left behind from, as you said, a lot of uh, male migrants and young and male migrants. So what is the effect uh, in the, the internal dynamics in families uh, in um, uh, left behind uh, families in, uh, in Ethiopia? And well, okay, a lot of suggestions, but I leave the floor now. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Rafaela. Thanks so much for both your contributions, Roy and Rafael. Um, uh, we have a lot on. There's also many questions in the chat. I want to go back to uh, Jasper first, because he has had most chance uh, and time to pause on, on and see some of the questions. So one, one big theme that runs through is the different connections between securities, multiple securities, really from a youth perspective. Uh, and, and and livelihoods, but there are some questions that ask about like the bigger, like shall I say, military security situation in West Africa, and questions specifically about the role of France, uh, and possible uh, possibly if you can respond to the implications of what have been the effects on youth mobility. So it's approaching it from the other end, Jesper. Right, thanks very much. Thank you to uh, the discussants as well and, and, and to all the questions coming up in the chat, not just to my own presentation. It's really interesting to, to see how uh, what, what people are picking up on here. Um, so, of course, I, I, I was quite um, vague or general in, in talking about youth in a fairly monolithic way, and I uh, the, there are many reasons not to do that, uh, uh, but but if we stay on the level of sort of broad dynamics, uh, I would say that, that there are several impacts affecting mobility dynamics, which of course also affect young migrants. And here it's not necessarily specifically youth related issues that, that I would emphasize. Um, as, as I said, the, the crisis in the Sahel is of course creating displacement and, and the kind of research that I, I learned from often emphasizes that displacement is not necessarily the end of the road, so to speak. Uh, displacement creates a lot of uh, needs, uh, but it also creates opportunities. I've studied displacements from the armed conflict in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, and what you see is that people may not move voluntarily, but you know, many, many migrants who move involuntarily are able to make the best of very difficult circumstances. So I think that the displacement story is not just a victim story. It's a, it's a uh, you know, it, there's a humanitarian dimension to that displacement crisis, but it's also important to see that, for example, uh, local communities in central Burkina Faso have an immense capacity in uh, uh, integrating uh, people for shorter, longer periods of time and, and offering sort of uh, uh, assistance and, and uh, accommodation, for example, spontaneously without the intervention of international agencies. So I think there's a need there to look at what local communities are actually doing to mitigate displacement dynamics in the region. I think that's really important. Another aspect that's also um, that comes up in a lot of conflict related research is that uh, the people who are actually able to leave conflict zones are not necessarily the worst off a lot of people become stuck in involuntary immobility, uh, which is much less visible, but might be really important to understand. So there may be a lot of people sort of stuck in very dangerous situations or in situations where they can't uh, uh, find ways of, of making a living, uh, but th that are less seen than the ones displaced. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I tried to, in, in terms of French intervention and the, the role of, in, of external actors in the region, there's a lot to say and there are a lot of, as I said, there's a lot of frustration. Uh, I would say that it's important to understand both the history of, 
of what is often called France Afrique in this region, the relationship between France and its former colonies in West Africa. Uh, uh, since the post-colonial era, there's been a lot of frustration that France is sort of keeping close alliances with political leaders in the region, nurturing its own interests through uh, African states. Um, it has been expressed in many different ways by many different actors, but I think it's part of the story. Uh, more specifically now, there's a lot of criticism against the Operation Barkhane, the French military force in, in the Sahel, because it's being accused of actually uh, feeding militarization rather than working towards appeasement by being taking a very militarized uh, uh, stand, which sometimes also contradicts the UN mission, uh, which is much more sort of emphasized on peace brokering, for example. Um, there's a lot more to say, but, but I agree with Roy that, that we should leave the floor also to the participants. Um, uh, one thing I would say is that frustrations around external intervention are also reflected in debates around migration control, as I sort of uh, implied as well, that there is frustration and critique that uh, the European agenda for migration management is actually much more geared towards European interests rather than, than African uh, interests. Uh, and I think that's important to acknowledge and, and uh, yeah, uh, make visible. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jesper. Um, there were some questions for Dorte and Adam Nash as well. So Dorte, if you could, uh, there, there's a question about if you have examples of young people returning to rural or areas and how they use the skills they learned uh, in informal um, areas. Uh, in informal jobs and also there's been a question to compare um, West Africa, so I'm asking that question to you Dot. Um, uh, the comment said uh, in Ethiopia families invest in young people migrating because they expect higher returns, how would you compare that the investment of family in female and, and male adolescents and youth in, in, in West Africa um, and uh, do you want to uh, take those? And you need to unmute. Daughter, unmute, please. <laughs> and for Adam Nash, there was a question from someone who has actually done the study on uh, also on migration in an area close to where you did your your research on that there is actually migration of people who are in government jobs while that should be considered decent jobs so why are they why are they moving so that one's next for you daughter can you hear me now yes okay great and i managed to unmute um so what was the first question again i've, I've really got technical problems here Um, about young people returning to rural areas, what skills do they bring home? And in, there was a comment about in Ethiopia, invest, there's family invest yes, in I young men migrating so, uh, rather than young women. Um, so how is that yeah. in, in West Africa? I've got that. With the rural returnees, often if they, if they return already uh, as young adolescents they don't bring very much because they haven't learned very much uh, they might have gotten some appreciation of the kind of work they need to do uh, and and working in a different way but in fact they haven't learned so many skills it's only after some years they begin to learn skills they learn to to work in a restaurant of course but but it's not really something that can be used back home and if they come back without any savings and without having really achieved anything they are just seen as small children and they slot into a children's space again and they migrated very often to gain some social skill, uh, some, some, some social status, I mean, uh, in terms of being seen as capable of earning money and saving up and, and buying, even buying clothing, buying small symbolic gifts, buying a bicycle, that's, that's the kind of that's the kind of start of a migratory uh, route. We're not talking big money there, as you heard, about a tenth. Uh, or a ninth of, of the formal uh, minimum wage, that they earn very little money. So what, what, what it is they need to show for attaining social status is that they can save up to buy small things like uh, clothing or a big thing like a bicycle. So if they've been working for a longer time, sometimes they bring skills home of being able to make bricks of 
if they've learned bricklaying, if they've learned other other skills. But very often, the skills that they're learning are really very much for for continuing life in um, in the urban setting. What rural parents appreciate is when they show uh, economic acumen of of being able to save up and and help out when need be. Um, the investment, well, the investment is not so large with this type of, of migration of uh, within within the country because the the, the bus fare is not very very expensive. It's not a, a, an investment that sending somebody abroad that happens as well, but it's more common that these rural youth come from such uh, poor families that they will be saving up themselves to move on, or they will borrow money from other migrants to, to uh, travel to Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, and then um, pay off their debts and then save up to move on if they want to move towards Central Africa, where, where there's a, a, a significant, significant, um, significant uh, amount of people uh, from Burkina Faso. If you're looking to Senegal and to Cote d'Ivoire, it's a little bit the same that people are saving up for the bigger journeys and there might be some investment in uh, helping them by selling sell, selling cattle or by selling land or by leasing out land. What I've seen until now is that the investment is mostly in young men. Uh, although if young women are traveling abroad, it's by plane, it's not over land. So that's a different type of, of, um, of investment. But uh, also returning to this, what does a rural area look like or the area where they come from? What does it look like for those who stay? Uh, by and large, everybody migrates, all the men, young men, adolescents, if they stay, they're sort of asked what's wrong with them. So there are not very many who stay. They at least go to the capital for a while. Uh, they very often go to neighboring countries. It might not go much further than that. But to remain home as a young man is not seen as a proper way of becoming a, an adult man. For young women, it's a different story. Young women want to migrate as well. They migrate with their husbands. Once they marry, they try to marry migrants. I'll leave it for Adamnes to answer. Thank you. Thanks, daughter. Yes, Adamnes, you want to take the question on the... Yes, go ahead. Okay, so um, I think the first part of the question is uh, whether the desirability of uh, formal work for the youth is changing. Well, former work in Ethiopia, informal work is uh, paying more than formal work in Ethiopia because for different reasons. One, the informal uh, work doesn't require much of um, a skill set and people can get this informal work uh, through relatives, through network and so on and so on. And second, there's no tax uh, or any government issued payments that have to be made by the employees so people of course if 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 um, they they can get the network they but especially the youth they prefer to be engaged in the informal work the other is well good job what is the definition of a good job so a good job in ethiopia is defined in terms of salary and the salary that people get particularly in, in the state-owned uh, organizations is not that much when you compare it with the inflation and uh, how the cost of living is rising up every day. I can give you an example. One of the girls that we have um, interviewed in, in that particular area works at the industrial park for Michael Kors, but she gets a, a salary of 1,100 1, or 1,200, if I remember correctly, which is, by the current currency around 30 or 35 dollars a month which is very low and which is uh, which doesn't even pay a house rent if you want to rent a decent uh, a decent uh, house so salary and next to unemployment low level of salary is the major driver of uh, migration from ethiopia the other issue is Returnees also have an impact, successful returnees. When they come back, they show off, they dress uh, good, they are supporting their family, the house of their families is a little bit more uh, 
uh, looks good more than the others and they uh, eat well nutrition wise uh, so all of these factors are in and people definitely would want to migrate because it pays more than uh, the local uh, employment that you can get and uh, you can also i can also give you another example we did this cash transfer project sometime uh, before and we we realized that people receiving that cash transfer for feeding their family were actually saving from that cash to finance a migration of their uh, family members whether it's young males or uh, females so migration is um very much accepted and wanted in ethiopia not just and there's also another perspective migration has stopped to be um just a way of a way uh, or moving out of poverty it's also a preference it's also a choice for better uh, to achieve better living standards so basically even if people have jobs um well good jobs as i said is are uh you know under quotation what are good jobs but um they still migrate yes if if i have answered the question thank you anamash um while we're with you uh, there was a question about whether uh you know of covid affecting remittances and since you were speaking about cash i want to first put it to you and then jesper also had something to say about okay that. so um, the the impact of uh, covid on remittances, we have not studied that yet. Uh, during the COVID, we did not do any study on that, but it definitely uh, will um, affect the remittance level because people are stranded. And as I said, they can't even engage in the informal jobs that they used to as before. And there is also a high number of migrants that are returning, particularly from Saudi Arabia and Yemen. So these returning migrants, of course, cannot no more send uh, remittances. They are returning back to become a burden on their families, let alone uh, increase the level of remittances. Of course, it, it, is, uh, it will be impacted, but um, it needs a, a study you know, to see the actual extent of uh, its effect on the remittance level. Thank you. Um, yes, Barry, you had something on the effect of, of COVID pandemic on remittances. Right. It's again very sort of non-committing and general, but I just I just want to note that, of course, remittances are an expression of, of you know, what migrants uh, are able to to accumulate in, in the countries where they are working and have can afford to, to send home. It's fairly obvious. And from what I've understood, the dynamic has been a, a sort of fairly dramatic decline in the first half of last year, but some tendency towards a rebound during the second half of, of uh, last year. So I think, you know, it's important to understand remittances in the in the context of an overall sort of economic recession and recovery, right? It's not an isolated an isolated phenomenon from the rest of, of the economy, um, and I think that's something also. Just since we're thinking about the effects of, of the pandemic, I think what we see both in our in the in the global north and and in in uh, parts of Africa is that. The pandemic is making visible and perhaps even exacerbating existing inequalities, right? It's sort of revealing some of the weaknesses of our societal structures, both in the global north and in the global south. And in those uh, weaknesses, one, one issue is sort of the, uh, the plight of, especially perhaps of undocumented migrants in the global north when it comes to remittances, right? That they, they have been extremely vulnerable. And we've seen, for example, uh, uh, Portugal and, and I believe Italy as well, trying to uh, act quickly to, to provide um, a naturalization or, or sort of a documented status for undoc undocumented migrants in order to include them also more in uh, uh, the, pa uh, the pandemic mitigation. So I think, yeah, I, just to emphasize that, I think the pandemic is really revealing some underlying structural uh, deficiencies all over the world that we should pay attention to. Thank you very much. Can I uh, say one last yes. thing on the COVID as well? It's also if we think about the 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 numbers who have been um, identified with COVID, it, it varies tremendously from one country to another. And in a lot of the Sahel countries, in fact, COVID is less of a concern. It's a, it's the 
is the insecurity around uh, radicalized uh, insurgents that are that are, are much more upfront for them. And it's partly because of that very few cases. And it's not just because they've not been able to, to identify them. They have had testing kits uh, delivered by, by various organizations and they have raised money for testing kits. So it's not just a question of testing. It is a matter of that they've had a low spread of COVID. And obviously that is also impacting on the way that then maybe not impacting on the way that they've done closures of markets and schools and so forth, but it's impacting on the way that people are responding to it. Thanks, your daughter. Um, we all, very lively discussion, which sadly I have to now cut off because um, we've reached the end of the, of the session, but I'm really pleased with the engagement throughout from the audience and um, and there was still one more uh, comment by Jim Samba who says, People have choices. Choosing to stay is important, and focusing on that. And what uh, and what stood out to me was how um, mobility is part of life, part of growing up. And there's choices through networks mediated by gender and and family that came out very very strongly. Uh, I want to thank the audience for joining us today uh, and our speakers. Thank you so very much for your engagement. The next webinar is on 30, Mar uh, 30 uh, of March and will uh, focus on the challenge challenges of job creation and decent work. So it picks up where Jesper has just left us off with the longer term impact of, of, of the pandemic. And um, we will share all the, the, the recordings on the event website as much as possible, all PowerPoints uh, and links to the uh, fu future uh, webinar events. Thank you so very much. Uh, I hope you will join us again on the 30th of March and I wish you a nice rest of the day. Thanks everyone.